by Barbara Nordia. No. Uh, from uh, DTU. No. Yeah. And uh, she will tell you about the illusions after the visual brain. Yeah, I actually just seeing double, which seems like uh, I got the right time slot at the end of the evening. <laughs> so, uh, more or less, my, time is, uh, uh, my talk is about how we can see things in different ways. So first of all, I'm interested in both how uh, we're able to interpret patterns, and I do this um, as a cognitive neuroscience scientist, so I'm not looking at individual neurons, I'm looking at human behavior and also brain activity and eye movement. And this is what, what, what it looks like. It's wearing an eye tracker. <laughs> so usually we are very good at recognizing objects and things that are around us in our everyday life. So that kind of gives the expectation that there is you know, an image in front of us. It's projected in the back of the brain, and there's this little monkey that's looking at the images. So I'm interested in also what happens when uh, we look at more challenging images or images interpret in different ways. And that's because vision is not just images being projected into the brain. There's also, for instance, uh, context, as we have in illusions like this, where we have lines that are actually the same length. But because we have the context, the different endpoints, some look longer than others. And these ones look curved. And also, your prior expectations um, help you shape um, your your understanding of what you're seeing now. So if you look at this image, uh, anybody has an idea what it is? It's cave. Cave? It's a cave. Yeah. A bear. That's not that's one. Somebody uh, somebody shouted Jesus last time. <laughs> 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 that, is that famous piece of church for Jesus? <laughs> so so if I give you a bit of context. Aww. Aww. Then it's obviously a cat sleeping in the <laughs> So already, uh, also you, the, what you already know shapes what you see. Then there's also getting back to the t double vision of seeing things in multiple ways. That's just images that are called bistable images, uh, where you can also see, if you look at this cube, you might be able to see it switch back and forth from that perspective. So more or less, this, this. The same goes for this one where there's a hidden image of a saxophone player or the face. Mm -hmm. So what I what I was mostly studying in my PhD is also um, how we can put um, together little elements that are meaningless on their own, their own and make it into um, one coherent uh, shape how we can make sense of local details and then uh, put them all together. Just to give you an example, if you look at these patches, um, do you see anything recognizable in them? If I put them together, anybody able to see? Didn't figure in there? It's a bit difficult because it gets slightly greater. So just like uh, Lindsay spent hours of looking at the, the food slice in the microscope, I spent hours having people looking at my patterns. Here's another example. The right. Any idea what the animal is in there? Rabbit. 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 A rabbit. Yeah. Oh, you can participate. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing another study. So there's, there's actually multiple ways. Oh. Look at this. Rabbits. So, so one of the questions I was interested in, why do we actually look when we're confronted with images like that, that first seems like black and white patterns, and eventually we recognize something? And where do we start looking, and where do we look when we actually recognize it? So what happens with our eye movements when we go from black and white pattern to Dalmatian? 
and I use these images called emerging images. Um, they come from a computer science lab and they're actually used to also benchmark computer vision algorithms with because humans can usually eventually recognize something hidden in here, but uh, computers are really bad at uh, they actually don't recognize whether there's an object or not. In and they're generated from, I don't know if anybody can recognize this one. Corridor or something? So, and they're made from um, 3D, uh, 3D figures, and then you map on the patterns onto the 3D model, and then you make a very similar background. And that generates these images that are challenging, challenging to recognize, but if you look at them for several seconds um, while really paying attention, most participants were able to recognize them. We did this uh, as an eye tracking experiment, um, so had people have their heads in this lovely medieval torture instrument. <laughs> There's no way a guillotine involved, uh, it's just to keep the head steady. And then the uh, fun of looking at pictures for hours and pressing a button when you recognize something. While the eye tracker is tracking uh, where people are looking at. Actually, uh, what we found out was that people are remarkably good at uh, finding the right location. So even in the beginning, that uh, within the first second, they're looking at where the hidden object is. Uh, in this case, a gorilla. And at the moment of recognition, they're usually spot on on the objects. This was um, so. These are the eye movements of uh, 18 participants. Um, it's a heat map, but. Uh, these are for Im uh, people who eventually recognize the image. That we also had participants that were completely off or looking in some other direction. I should also say, since there's a lot of scientists in here, we did, um, I'm only showing you one image here. Uh, we did do a lot of uh, tests also, um, like having the object placed in uh, dif different locations in the image. So it's not just the bias of people looking more that just in the middle. We also had images without objects. Um, and we did statistical testing on it. But uh, event, what we showed was that even within the first 500 mill milliseconds, people are usually looking at the right area where the hidden object is. But yet they take about five um, seconds to uh, indicate that they recognize it and that they come from. So people are fast uh, at finding out where to look, but it takes a while to really realize what they're looking for. <coughs> The next question is also, what happens in the brain when you are looking at these images? What happens again when you go from um, spots to domain? I'm just going to give you a very quick primer on the visual cortex. So this was not done in fruit flies, but in cats uh, originally. Uh, you had an electrode in the visual cortex um, recording from one cell, and then um, you also had a bar of light moving in the visual field. And you can see that the um, ISO had a location in the visual field and an orientation uh, where it had its preferred response. So it would respond, respond the most to a specific location in the visual field and a specific orientation. It's also organized so that uh, neurons uh, next to it would also have uh, a response to a location in the visual field adjacent to it. So it's not randomly organized that there's one responding to the center and one periphery that uh, cluster together. So more or less, um, again, there's of course no images in the brain, but if you have the brain here with the occipital lobe, uh, lobe and primary visual cortex here in the back, um, and here the visual field, and then you would see that um, this part responds mostly to the center of the visual field, and here you have more the point. It's also distorted, so there's way more space uh, in the brain for the central visual field than the peripheral visual field. And everything is upside down, and left, right, and left. So this is more or less visual field, and this is if you reconstruct it in the, in the cortex. Then the, the central is magnified in terms of the response. And I did my experiments with the uh, MRI, so here's just a regular MRI scan, and I worked uh, with functional MRI, so also looking at not only the structure, but also where there's more 
lot of uh, indicating activity. And for that also, again, you have this uh, organization of the visual brain that you can see that it responds more to the, you know, yeah, the back, more to the center of the visual field and more to the peripheral visual field. So because you can map that, you can find out which part of the brain responds to which part uh, of um, the stimuli where the person is looking. And I use that also to then have a look at what happens before and after recognition. And uh, what I found was if you subtract um, the brain activity before people were able to recognize the images and afterwards, you actually also find and project the, the brain activity back into the visual field coordinates. You also uh, find some of the same patterns almost as the eye movements. There was also an increase in activity in the, in the areas of the brain that respond to that specific location where people were also attend. As you say, in, in these experiments, uh, of course, people keep their eyes uh, fixated on the middle of the screen, so it's not just because they move their eyes around. So what, um, yeah, what's interesting about this is also usually um, the earlier visual cortex is mostly thought to just respond to what's in the visual field, but here we see also a um, moment of recognition um, changes the activity there. So why, why is this all uh, useful to study or why do I think that we should study not only simple objects but also things that are really complicated to recognize? Um, for instance, also if we're working in the computer vision and trying to figure out how humans are recognizing things, if you take this and just do a Google image search on it, Google mm -hmm. does a fairly good job. Mm -hmm. But if we take more complicated objects that require, requires more of an understanding of what's in there and also abstract thinking, then uh, the computer system usually completely fails. So I took uh, some, some drawings of uh, an artist friend of mine, Pinay Moskow, and also did the same, did a, a Google image search to ask Google to find similar images. And uh, you can also interpret it. I, I really like she does. Uh, objects that are not quite, um, yeah, they don't look at, like anything specific. They're still ambiguous enough to kind of have multiple. These are very pale, but who came up with all these party props? And also uh, some nice boxes, some, pins, some paper wrapping, and I think mostly the system went by um, by colors. So if we want to have, um, I don't know, if we want to have intelligent machine singularity, self-driving cars, and this is the closest match. You can come up with this. I think there's still also something to be learned from the human brain about how we can do more complicated recognition tasks than just recognizing simple things in good writing right in front of us. And from a whole different perspective, it's also Pete Mondrian that also went from going to drawing these very uh, tree looking trees to seeing how far can you actually take it. When is a tree still a tree? So he named all these paintings uh, tree paintings. But I think he was also trying to get at the edges of human recognition. So I think it's also something that's interesting to he explore from an artistic point of view. So this actually sums up my, my talk. That um, you know, as a vision scientist, I'm interested in both that seeing is about the uh, context, expectations, and also that we humans are actually quite sophisticated in finding meanings and patterns that are very difficult to interpret. So, Do you think you would? I don't know, I don't think so. so if you were given access to all the images you could find, um, would you 
do go by color? Would you go by shape? I'd find like a conch shell, but if I'm colorblind, I might find like a poo emoji up yeah. top in the road. <laughs> <laughs> swirl. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm wondering like what is a, what is the objective like good answer here? What should the algorithm find? Yeah, that's it. I think I also try to do it with some, some simple line drawings also, and there I think also humans would still perform much better. I think right here is also, I don't have a match rate for what is a good match or good recognition. Yeah, I guess it would also depend on maybe what specific task you have in mind. When humans also find the tree drawing of the next slide, the last one, as a tree, uh, maybe some would, but, but the most people agree with the artist, is that just too abstract? I think that's that's why the interesting part comes when, when there's not agreement always. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's also why we spend so much time looking, uh, people still spend a lot of time looking at art and looking at things that are ambiguous, looking in the clouds and finding shapes. And uh, I think that's also what keeps us interested in a way. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine there's maybe also, yeah, a, part, a reward in finding something where you didn't expect to find something until you took a closer look. So, very nice presentation. Uh, regarding the, the dot pictures, mm -hmm. the, how, how, I don't know if you know, but how does the brain, the human brain, react when the person knows what it's looking for? For example, if I want to find my keys, I cannot find them. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but, here, there was just like dots, and then you ask them to what's in the picture. Yeah. Uh, so does the human brain react differently if it knows what it's looking for in the picture? I did measure it in the, in the MRI scanner, but I did do it with eye movements. We had different types of uh, priming, so we showed uh, people either exactly the same shape uh, located at the same location, or we showed them um, a photograph of, for instance, a gorilla, or we showed them the world gorilla. And they had pretty similar eye movements, so I think there's still something in, inherent in the structure, in the images, um, that, that attracts the eye movements, but people still get the idea that, that this is probably the most sensible place to look. But they were much faster at recognizing the image, so, so because you have I think you don't have to search that much or think that much. What is it? If you already have even just a word to, to guide you into that. I don't know how to find the keys always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. And I was wondering, because I guess you have uh, do this test with a lot of people, have you found any gender, age, or nationality bias in how we see these images? I think it would be, uh, there is a lot of literature around there also with, um, for instance, different optical illusions where, for instance, psychiatric patients yes. are, are more fooled by them or less fooled by them. Mm -hmm. but with schizophrenia, for instance, uh, with the size illusions, they don't really have the, uh, with the sticks I showed them in the beginning, they definitely much see the sticks as the same thing. I didn't really, I noticed that, that there was a lot of individual differences. I didn't really see it linked to gender, but it was really a challenge to find images. Uh, and I did go through hundreds of images to find a set that was challenging enough that people didn't recognize it immediately, but still a majority would recognize them. But I think, um, yeah, we, we also did it mainly with, psycho uh, with psychology students as okay. <laughs> medicine students, which is typical of uh, most cognitive neuroscience experiments. And I think yeah, you could also go out and explore them with different ages and different populations. Yeah. Um, I noticed you had a few um, animals in, that, in those pictures. One of the gorilla was, of course, a face. I'm wondering whether there's facial recognition of if, the, if it moved faster when there was a face portrayed in the dots? They were, they were all animals, actually. It's yeah. just, uh, yeah, envision if it's not a face or, or a place, then it's an object, <laughs> uh, So I also call the animals objects, but they were all animals. And there's, I think, when you create things in 3D, those animals have very iconic shapes. Or, uh, 
giraffe or a horse or a gorilla or something like that. So and people were all always looking at the front or the face part. Yeah. So there was no I suppose specifically with the gorilla because of it's such a similar uh, shape to a human face. Was there any speed difference? I think so, no. But people uh, were very consistent with the gorilla because it has this long table as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking actually this thing of uh, people in the first 500 milliseconds, I think you said, that they focus on the area where the shape actually is. Uh, because I had the same feeling when I look mm. at the figures at the very beginning, I was just like, I don't know why, but my side just went straight to, to where it's supposed to be. I couldn't see anything, but I know that it was there somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have... Because I guess that there can be patterns almost everywhere in those pictures that you show, even if there is not a gorilla or whatever, but that you can always find something, I guess, if you keep looking. Uh, do you have any idea of what's actually driving such mm -hmm. a fast response to that? I think there's still more structure. Um, I did uh, so. A lot of people had the same experience as you. I think I had them um, like a nature documentary do a little voiceover when I was testing the stimuli. So I had people talk, say, and tell me what they were actually experiencing as they were seeing the images. And a lot of it was, like, yeah, I think I see something there. <laughs> I think it's over there uh, without necessarily recognizing it. So I think a lot of people had that experience that they knew where there was something happening. Um, I try to do um, some of the uh, more common uh, uh, vision algorithms, so I did um, uh, yeah, edge detection and saliency modeling and a few others to see if any of any computer uh, models uh, could predict where people would be looking and there would be more. So okay. I think it's still, uh, maybe I should investigate this also with some computer sciences because uh, I think it's still don't we? Oh my. It's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, I think it's also kind of interesting that there's always animals in the figures. Like, uh, it kind of reminds me of being in a forest or a wood somewhere or something in nature and just see some kind of figure of something. Often you have to look a while until you recognize by movement that there's something there. And if you're the human, developed in this kind of environment, it matters a lot if you can spot a frog on a log or something and then catch it and eat it, or uh, like uh, not get eaten by a jaguar, which is kind of camouflage or um, you see its movement. So it, if we're very primed to recognize those kind of patterns of animal faces or uh, organisms that move and stuff, um, maybe computer programs needs like to find boundaries and stuff and we just need anything that has like seemingly symmetrical eyes or something. Uh, do you think that that might have like some yeah, some influence on why we're so good at recognizing animal shapes? Mm, I'm not sure if it's particular with animal shapes to me because I haven't te uh, tested it with other shapes. Uh, I think there's definitely something also to the human ability of re uh, finding regularities and patterns and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and where a lot of computer vision uh, will look at uh, more colors or edges or something like that. And here there's, what makes these images tricky is there's no e edges, there's no clear thicker ground segregation. So you draw an object that will be a line around uh, the figure on the background. We don't have that. <laughs> There's probably multiple ways why, for instance, we evolved in being good at spotting predators in uh, the wild. Uh, colors also another one often. I think there's also a bit like the image of the Dalmatian I had. There's a, another famous psychology image of the, in black and white where there's the predator hidden and you can only see it if you have the color. So I think there's a lot of different cues also maybe detecting different camouflage. Last question here. Yeah. Can then older animals do the same as you, or is only like humans and they have this ability? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just 
except for I think we're the animals. only maybe <laughs> we're the only animal uh, spending a lot of yeah. time in museums and creating abstract art. So I think the ability to uh, create something might uh, be more human. Uh, but yeah, definitely create. Yeah. But uh, recognizing things and recognizing that, um, something hidden um, in, in a busy area, I think that's. Animals, many animals also see differently. Yeah. Humans, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? They might have different mechanisms, different percep perception of the image. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arthur.